Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Vinnie DeMarco. I'm the president of the Maryland Healthcare for All uh, Coalition, and we're thrilled to be here in Howard County as part of our series of forums across the state about prescription drug affordability and making prescription drugs more affordable for Marylanders. Thanks in large part to the leadership of leaders like County Executive Calvin Ball and his fellow county executives around the state, Maryland became the first state in the nation to enact in 2019 a prescription drug affordability board authorized and assigned to make high cost drugs more affordable for state and local governments. I want to recognize two very important people in making that happen. First is Senator Clarence Lamb, who when there was an effort to, strong, to weaken the bill in the state Senate, the person who stood up to them on the floor of the Senate was Senator Clarence Lamb. He, he did a great job of making sure the bill was strong. And Delegate Courtney Watson is here also. <laughs> Always a very strong supporter of public health, including the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. I want to thank the two of them and their colleagues uh, very, very much. And we have a lot to celebrate now, as you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act. I was honored to be at the White House yesterday for the celebration by uh, President Biden, Vice President Harris, and of course, our wonderful congressional delegation. We have Jessica from Senator Van Hollen's office and Bridget Smith from Congressman John Sarbane's office here with us. And thanks, let's have a big hand for, for them. Both senators and seven of our eight members of the House voted for and really played a key role in making that happen. So what we're doing is having events across the state to highlight the success at the national and state level and to talk about where we go from here. And we kicked it off last night with a webinar virtual forum in which Senator Van Hollen spoke and he was excellent talking about Inflation Reduction Act and what's going on in Maryland. And um, uh, uh, Andy York, who is the executive director of the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, talked last night. And that is on our Facebook page. If you want to take that link and send it around to people, we encourage you to do so. But today, we're starting in-person events. And uh, you know, as county exec, we always start in our county. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, when we had events about the board being created, when it was just created, we always start here. Uh, and, and we're here to talk with you about what the Prescription Drug Affordability Board is doing. You'll be hearing from one of their terrific uh, members and how we can work together to make it stronger. There are two goals here today. One is to inform you all and your friends and colleagues about what's happening. And second, to learn more about how high-cost drugs are hurting you. We have some colleagues here, uh, Catherine kirk Robbins, Suzanne Schlotman, Stephanie Clapper, Sheena Oji, who will be personing tables here that after we're done, if you want to tell a story about how high-cost drugs hurt you and your families, please do so, or any other comments you have about this issue. We'll take them down and make sure the board gets them, and I think uh, Dr. Barry Onokawa will let you know. Will tell you that the board appreciates uh, these kind of comments. Um, uh, before I open it up, though, I want to recognize two tremendous women in the audience: Carol Fisher and Mae Beal, who uh, are our two uh, Howard County, or should I say, Maryland's leading people, waking uh, work, work happening on public health and progress in, in, in many fronts and. May is on the Central Committee, and Carol's just in charge of everything, aren't you, Carol? So uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you guys here with us. Um, so um, thank you uh, to everybody in Howard County for hosting us here for our very first in-person forum. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, County Executive Calvin Ball. You all know him much better than I do, but I can tell you that since he's been County Executive, and even before that as County Council person, Whenever we needed help in Annapolis, he was always there. And he was always there in a brilliant and very effective way to make sure the Annapolis legislators know that the people of Howard County want public health progress, including 
on making prescription drugs uh, more affordable. And I thank you, County Executive Ball, for your tremendous public health leadership in Howard County and across the state. And exec I just want to thank Vinny again for his leadership and his partnership and always continuing to push us to do better and to be better. I also want to just uh, echo his acknowledgments and thoughts and you know I really appreciate the partnership that has taken place at every level. I'd like to uh, finally acknowledge uh, my team uh, led by Jenna at the Office of Aging and Independence who has done a fantastic job uh, making sure that Howard County moves toward being uh, more of an age-friendly county, and we're right here at a 50-plus center, uh, having these important conversations. Howard County is a place that has been acknowledged by U.S. News and World Reports as one of the healthiest communities in the nation. We just recently won the coveted Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize, one of four jurisdictions of over about 3,000 in the nation. Whoa. We led on our pandemic response and we have worked to address those who are uninsured and underinsured. However, while these are fantastic accolades, they just underscore the importance of not only making sure that we're healthy for all, and not merely overall, but that we lead the way for the rest of the state and the nation. And forums like these are incredibly important. You know, here I am, a relatively healthy individual. However, my sister and I share care for my mom. Uh, I have two young daughters. So I'm in that sandwich generation uh, where prescription drug affordability still impacts me. And forums like these make it so that beyond all of those fantastic accolades, each and every one of you puts a face, a story toward prescription drug affordability, making it so that as our friends in Annapolis continue to fight, our friends in Washington continue to fight. They know that they're not just fighting for an ideal. They're fighting for you. They're fighting for families. They're fighting for everyone else who is caring for their parent, everyone else who is caring for their child, everyone else who may be sitting home and thinking, I'm invisible. You all, with your stories, with your advocacy, are turning that invisibility to invincibility. Mm. So thank you so much for being here, and thank you again, Vinny, and everyone who helped make today important and success in every day leading up to today, and here's to creating even better tomorrows for everyone. Thank you. You guys are so lucky to have Calvin Balls, your county executive here. Thank you very much. I do have one other request. When we finish, before everybody leaves, we need a picture of all of us behind our Healthcare for All banner. So we want to make sure we, uh, we do that. Next, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Abere Onokawa, who's got a tremendous story of how she became a member of the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. She read about it. She read about this law that you guys passed. And she called the speaker's office, Speaker Adrian Jones' office, and said, I think I'm qualified to be on that board. And you know what? She is a, a, a professor at University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. She has such an incredible background in addressing uh, uh, health inequities and in just really understanding the problem of high cost drugs uh, for people. And um, Catherine and I met her soon after she got appointed and boy, were we impressed. We, we did not know who the speaker was gonna be. Oh, and there's another hero of mine, Liz Bobo, former delegate, welcome Liz. <laughs> Former delegate, former county exec, and a great, great Marylander. So um, uh, I, I want to just say we are so lucky that uh, Dr. Onokawa picked up that paper and saw the article and called the speaker, and that the speaker, who we all love and is a great hero of ours, knew enough to say she is the right person to be the board. The board has five people, chaired by uh, Van Mitchell, former health secretary, who's also really uh, terrific, uh, Professor Jerry Anderson, 
uh, uh, from Hopkins and two other people, and they are a really terrific group who are doing a lot to implement the law that we all fought so hard for. So right now I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Onokawa to explain to you all what the board has done and what's next to do and how uh, we, all can, um, we all can work together to make Maryland continue to be one of the leading states on prescription drug affordability. Dr. Onokawa? She's a Howard County resident. As well, exactly. But four daughters to keep life busy. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation, for the opportunity to be back here in this beautiful space. I recall it was January of 2020, before we understood what was about to happen. Mm -hmm. We gathered here. I was privileged since then to attend many of these fora, but I always hold a dear spot for the Howard County Forum. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I want to thank Vinny and the Healthcare Coalition team for hosting these events. We've learned a lot about affordability uh, from individual perspectives of state residents uh, through these four, and I'm glad to see them back in person. I also want to congratulate all the leadership, both state, county leadership, ex county executive ball, for all the support in front, behind the scenes to get the different legislation passed, both to support the board, more recent legislation around insulin costs, sport burden, and of course, the Inflation Reduction Act, which we are all still in the midst of celebrating as an historic uh, legislation. Finally, I do want to thank our Maryland state residents for their continued tenacity in pushing these issues and keeping them front and center. So I'm here to provide a brief update on what the board's been accomplishing and working on over the last couple of years. Um, I also wanted to state that I've gotten questions a lot about, well, how does your work complement what's going on at the federal level? So I'll speak to that uh, briefly. So uh, as I mentioned before, we are attending these forums. Um, what we do as a board has been to take the legislative metrics, take what's been authorized um, and under our purview, and identify the how-to, the next steps for how do we go ahead and implement that. Well, the first thing we had to do is stand up the board, stand mm -hmm. up an organization, get offices, staff hide, and all of that. So that's uh, been a big bulk of the work, I would say, over the last 18 months or so. And now we're getting into the meat, uh, thinking about our metrics, pushing out reports. The most recent one has been uh, getting a draft version of our supply chain report out and shared with our 26 member stakeholder council. Also wanted to mention that with the support of the stakeholder council, we have put out our initial risk list of short-term recommendations that we have now received authorization and given our staff authorization to push forward. So one of them is exploring the upper payment limit. The UPL is certainly by far the most uh, uh, visible uh, piece that we talk about with the board. But we need an action plan for that. How do the cost reviews happen? How do those feed into potential UPL recommendations? And really laying out what it means to implement upper payment limits for certain drugs. After that plan is developed and approved, we then vote on it, and it goes to the Legislative Policy Committee for their consideration. We've also received in the short term uh, approved a recommendation to implement a transparency program now you might ask, how does transparency impact affordability? Well, information impacts affordability, and as much information as we can gain around cost setting, price setting, where are these rebates uh, impacting affordability, gives us visibility to the data that we see, that we work with, and a lot of what we are working with are claims data, hospital data, data that are publicly available or licensed, uh, most recently been working with the all-payer claims database, Medicare data, Medicaid data. But what's visible there are wholesale acquisition costs and other prices. We don't see the net costs. We don't see the rebates, the discounts. And until we can understand as much of the details around true net price, um, that limits our ability to set policy that's impactful and useful. So the transparency piece is important. We also recently uh, approved the recommendation to set up an incident affordability program. Now, at the state level, at the federal level, that's been certainly in the news. 
but not much has been talked about around the uninsured, and so that's uh, a piece that we're looking at. Now, I mentioned the data sets that we're using. We use these data to set and understand uh, price and the cost burden to insurers. That data does not give us visibility to the cost burden to patients outside of out-of-pocket costs. And so that's where interacting with the community for us such as these give us a better understanding of what does affordability mean at the patient level, at the family level, at the community level. And so while we can operationalize some cost measures, we're really looking to be holistic in our application and understanding of these concepts. We've learned from COVID about burden and what uh, clinical burden means to families and the resulting financial burden. We've also learned about disparate burden and how this burden can be differential and that there are subpopulations that suffer more, whether it's age, geography, race, ethnicity that defines those subpopulations. So we're really wanting to recognize our first in nation status, understand that there, aren't much, uh, there isn't much guidance, much precedence to go from, and we're comfortable with that because we want to be transparent in our decision making. We want to be data driven. We also want to be patient data driven. So we value these fora. Thank you for the support in terms of coming to our board meetings. Our next one coming up uh, is later this month, the 26th, I believe. Um, there's opportunity to submit public comments to every board meeting. I think I was just talking with Jim here. Our, our deadline for submitting public comments is the 19th. So whether you submit comments or not or, or um, participate in that way, we certainly do encourage attending our meetings uh, and then giving us feedback on the work as we move this work forward. Again, thank you for the time today and really pleased to be here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Onokawa, very, very much. And Onokawa, Dr. Onokawa mentioned the insulin issue. Um, and I, I want to say, you know, as you'll hear a little more from um, our next speaker, but the, the Federal Inflation Reduction Act, as you know, limits what people pay who are on Medicare for insulin no more than $35 per month. And thanks to the leadership of uh, the legislators we have here, Senator Lamb, Delegate Courtney Watson, and mostly one who couldn't be here, um, she's in Seattle, is uh, uh, Delegate Jocelyn Pena Melnick, who is the chair now of the House Health and Government Operations Committee. And she led on a bill this year to provide a $30 a month uh, cap for people on a commercial insurance um, on, on insulin. But as Dr. Onokawa said, it doesn't affect, doesn't help people who are uninsured and many others. And we're thankful that the board is looking uh, very, very closely uh, at, the, at that. So um, our final speaker today is uh, Jim Gutman from AERP. AERP is a leading, leading top organization in getting this legislation passed in Maryland and the Inflation Reduction Act. Maybe he can, Jim could talk to us a little bit about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but I also want to recognize and many other uh, organizations helped, a lot of faith groups. I want to recognize Reverend Sandra Connor with the ba uh, Minister's Conference of Baltimore and Vicinity. Faith leaders from all across the state played a big role. The NAACP played a big role. Jonathan McKinney's here, the NAACP. Thank you for everybody. Uh, uh, but uh, Jim, in addition to being a Howard County resident, a top AARP leader, is also a member of the Stakeholder Council. And Dr. Onokawa mentioned that council. In addition to the five-person board, there are 26 members of the stakeholder council, including folks like Jim um, and uh, uh, representing ARP, uh, our own Glenn Schneider from Howard County represents our, our coalition, and there are many other great people on that uh, council, as well as manufacturers, drug manufacturer folks, and insurers, and hospitals, and doctors. So uh, it's a council that is really good at giving advice uh, to the board from a broad perspective. So I'd like to ask uh, Jim Gutman, who's a true leader in making prescription drugs more affordable in Maryland and across the country, to talk with us a little bit about the AARP's role. Jim. <clears throat> Thank you, Vinny. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you, County Executive, for being here. Uh, these meetings are, to me, real important for multiple reasons, and I want to uh, go into those from each of the organizations that uh, I, uh, I'm privileged to be a part of. Uh, from AARP's standpoint, uh, what's going to make changes, what's going to help us is getting feedback from the public on specific kinds of problems that 
uh, on prescription drugs that you need help with and that we can try to help with on the board uh, with members like Aberic can help uh, with. So uh, ARP, along with Healthcare for All and, and many of these legislators, uh, pushed for the bill that uh, passed that set up the board. Uh, it's important to know that this is, uh, Maryland is a pioneer in this. So it has no real other states to look at and say, how did they do that? Uh, this board has to figure it out on its own, and it's doing a, a terrific job of doing that. Uh, Vinny mentioned the, uh, the federal legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, provisions. Uh, AARP nationally, of course, was a very prominent proponent of that. I think probably all of you saw the commercials uh, that uh, were run uh, for a long period of time and on many uh, media uh, in support of that, uh, the person who was giving his experiences uh, in uh, the most uh, prominent of those commercials was a Maryland resident, Larry Zarzecki, who is uh, an AARP uh, leader, and he's going to be in one of uh, these forums as well. So uh, that kind of information that helped uh, tailor the promotional campaign came out of these kind of settings, and that's why it's really important uh, to get this kind of information here. Uh, the next hat I'm, I'm sort of wearing is for the Stakeholder Council. And the Stakeholder Council uh, can best assist the board, and that's our function, if we have the material uh, to go to board members and say, hey, how about this, or maybe this would help, or how can we help you uh, do this? And these sessions, again, are very useful for that. And uh, I've uh, since the board's inception, I've uh, heard every one of those meetings online. Uh, hopefully, we'll start to get uh, to do them in, in person. And I'm just so impressed by the caliber of the people on the board, and particularly the executive director, uh, Andy York. Uh, they're plowing ground, and they're doing it in the right way. They're getting the evidence. They're moving as quickly as they can to take action. Uh, as Abera said, we're getting on the verge of the initial steps, uh, upper payment limits, which will affect uh, initially just a government, but that includes state and local government, uh, uh, and hopefully eventually will the general public. Uh, this is going to be a, a big help. The upper payment limits would affect how much uh, the buyers, uh, like the state and local government, will pay. Uh, it would not uh, affect how much uh, producers can charge, the courts have said. You can't do that. Uh, but uh, the board is, is moving in the right direction on all this, and again, with this kind of information that we're getting here today, that'll help. The uh, third hat uh, that uh, I'm wearing, and uh, I particularly want to hear information from uh, today, is that I'm a volunteer ship uh, Medicare prescription drug plan counselor in Howard County. I've been in Howard County three years, they have a terrific uh, director, Aisha Tukbe, and it's under the aegis of Jenna Crowley, uh, and uh, I'm pleased every fall to work on uh, that. I did it uh, three years before in another county. I hear the stories during there, and I I'm proud of what we're able to do to help people, but I also see a lot of cases where we can't help people enough, and that's what we need to focus on here. How can we do that within uh, the constraints and within our abilities, what can we change to make that better? And hearing from you about this is also going to help us in that. So for all of these reasons, uh, I'm real pleased to be in, uh, here at the forum, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you with what you want to find out. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for your great service with all three of your hats. Uh, to summarize what we've heard, the Prescription Drug Affordability Board law that could have been enacted without Calvin Ball's leadership and Senator Lamb, Delegate Watson. That law created the board and gives them authority right now to make high-cost drugs more affordable for state and local governments. They're in the process of working it out. Now, the law, the actual making the drugs more affordable for state and local governments was supposed to take effect January 1 of this year. Unfortunately, Governor Hogan vetoed a funding bill. And thank you, legislators, for overturning that veto. But that delayed the board's ability to achieve its goals. But they're still doing a great job. And as you heard from Dr. Onokawa that's, and Jim, they're, they're working it out. And soon we will have that. 
And once that's done, we hope the board will go back to the legislature and request the authority to impose, uh, impose, uh, use upper payment limits to make high cost drugs more affordable for all Marylanders. And we will certainly uh, support that legislation. But right now, we're working with the board and supporting the board in its efforts to implement what, what's, uh, what's there now. I want to give you two websites, um, pdab.maryland.gov. pdab.maryland.gov is where you could go and, and we'll send it around every pdab.maryland.gov and you can find out everything the board's doing. You could go to the meetings online or in person and you could submit comments. So that's one. And the other, if you want to submit your own thoughts on how high cost drugs are hurting you, go to healthcareforall.com slash rx input. Thanks, uh, Suzanne, for making that such an easy one. healthcareforall.com slash rx input. If you go there, then you could put in there how high cost drugs are, are hurting you and your families. And if you do that, we'll make sure Dr. Uh, Onakawa and the rest of the members of the board get that information and try to figure out how, how to deal with it. So that's where we are and that's where we're going. What I'd like to do now is open it up to some questions and then do not leave until we get the banner picture. And then after we get the banner picture, we have these tables set up where you can talk with folks on, on, on our team about your stories if you want to do that more in depth than, than a question.